Good afternoon. Hey guys, how's it going? How's it going? <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, Doobie. Good afternoon, everybody. How's it going? It is a choppy, choppy day. The spy was a little bit late on my bounce call, but uh, it did bounce eventually. It did do it. Sure enough, we got that MACD cross, and now it's just shooting for the stars. All right. How's everybody doing today? Hopefully everybody got a lead on this um, on this market bounce. It wasn't a perfect call, but it was it was pretty close. All right, let's cover some of the market events that we've got in front of us. So right now we got SPY doing a double bottom bounce from one day to the next. We had two bottom wicks here intraday uh, yesterday. It was a pretty brutal Tuesday, but today we have gotten one heck of a rally. Spy's currently up. What is this? Almost 2%. Very close. Seizing back all the losses from the day before. So if you did happen to get calls, at least uh, at least at some point in the uh, in the morning session yesterday, you should still be green, but uh, hopefully you got them a little bit later in the afternoon anticipating that spy bounce off of the uh, 390 level. What gave this level away was that this was a significant area of support previously, back in late July. We had a, uh, a retracement off of this bull flag, and we bounced twice off of this area before we started sailing again. Now, I don't think that we'll get quite back up to these levels. Um, I think that the spy is just pricing in a... 75 basis point hike from the Fed, and that is the cause for this move, is just a little bit more lift before the uh, final CPE print comes in. But I am anticipating a little bit more selling yet to come later on in the month. This is kind of in line with uh, seasonality. With, um, with September, we get an immediate sell-off in... Uh, in late August, going into the first week of September, and then uh, right there after that that sell off, we get a big bump back up in the uh, in the broader market. And then once it hits its previous high, according to seasonality, which should place us somewhere around the four hundred dollar mark, that's when we resume selling off and we see a new low going out till the uh, later two weeks of September. So we're on we're on track with seasonality, so that's actually pretty encouraging. So if you're playing just the seasonality chart, you should be doing extraordinarily well. Uh, if you did end up playing UPRO to the upside, then congratulations. That's a 5.1% move. Very nice. Um, I did not play UPRO, but I have been watching very closely uh, the VIX, looking for another opportunity to go short. I decided just to kind of stay out of the way of the SPY and looking for that new short opportunity for a better entry. Uh, and I'm going to guess that it's going to come sometime when the VIX bounces off of its 200 period, one hour moving average, somewhere around 24 flat. 
Um, it may get down a little bit lower. The daily chart shows that uh, VIX is currently trading below its 200 moving average. So if it bounces off of uh, 24, that would be in line with this 50 period moving average on the daily chart. Um, but seeing as we got a uh, crossover with the VIX, I don't really trust crossovers with VIX too much just because volatility by its nature is pretty unpredictable. Um, but I, I think we get a bounce off of this 50 moving average right here at 24 before we start the uh, next leg of selling in the SPY. But uh, yeah, my, my thought is to look to see what this um, what this bull flag finishes up shaping up to be. As you can see, we've got a little bit of a flag on the VIX, and it seems to be breaking down. So I'm guessing on a little bit of chop down here before we re-enter and then get another leg up. I think we got enough uh, people uh, in the chat to get things started. If you guys wouldn't mind, just if you... Uh, wouldn't mind leaving a like on the video and share on Twitter or social media so that we can get a few more people in the stream. It's always appreciated. Let's cover over uh, cover some of the other tickers that we've been paying attention to. Uh, uh, thank you for the call out in the live stream chat, Chef. I see uh, the target for uh, 401.56 before heading back down on the SPY. Um, I, I could agree with that. I look for the significant round numbers whenever I'm making these callouts. And I do like I do like that. That would be putting us right at the uh that would be putting us right at around where the uh where the 50 period moving average on the daily chart would be. So maybe before Friday, we see SPY climb back up to uh, 401, and then we get rejected off of that moving average. We have a cluster of all these moving averages coming together right in that price uh, right in that price range. So you have the 100, the 50, and this uh, nine period all converging on this price range around $400. And this is an area that has been significant resistance for the spy on its way up so i'm i'm gonna guess that once we hit it again we're going to have to stay there for at least a little while maybe a day maybe two days before we start seeing the next leg of selling but selling will come so if you're long on uh if you're long on puts going out till the end of the month then and you're debating whether or not it's a good idea to sell right now. Honestly, with with the price moving as far as it has already, as long as you're far enough out on puts, you are not likely to lose very much to Theta, but everybody has to make that decision for themselves. It's a matter of whether you're willing to watch that uh, watch Theta eat away at those puts a little bit, or if you want to try to time the market, I don't agree with that uh, That that process. I don't think that that's a, a good way to play it. It's a little bit more stressful. You have to watch things really closely. So if you do plan on doing something like that, please be very careful. Um, but uh, also keep in mind that tomorrow we're going to be having the uh, Fed chair coming out to speak, and that's going to probably bring some pretty... <laughs> that's going to probably bring some some bearishness to the market. I'm expecting bears to run rampant as soon as Powell goes up onto the uh, podium, similar to what we saw with uh, Jackson Hole. Or maybe it'll happen once he steps off, since that's when the actual sell-off occurred after the Jackson Hole Symposium. If you guys have a question in the Discord, feel free to uh, drop it in live stream questions, or you can uh, drop something here in the YouTube chat. Either way, it works. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few other things. Uh, one other thing that I'm watching very closely is the bonds. Um, I know that bonds are kind of boring, but bond traders have been right about this market consistently over the last 
psh, I don't know, ever. Right now, the 10-year yield has been dropping, so bonds are getting bought up pretty, uh, uh, pretty quickly. We're seeing it slow down right here at around the 50-period moving average on the 2-hour chart. And we're forming what looks like on the daily chart to be a uh, tweezer top. We have to see if this candle closes any further below. But uh, even since the last time that we had engulfing candles, I do want to point out the technicals aren't the greatest when it comes to bonds. Um, but what bonds can tell you is what direction the market is likely to take. And when bonds are going up, especially the long-term bond yields, um, that is usually bad for the market because it's causing money to come out of the bonds market, which is going to put pressure on the stock market as well. And as we've seen with the uh, with the short-term T-bills, like the one month, the three month, the six month, all of them have been surging over the long term. And now we're seeing a lot of volatility and chop coming into the T-bills in the market. The sell-off I think will be short-lived, or I should say the um, the bond buying, which causes the yields to drop, will be short-lived. But after uh, after we get through this chop period, I expect the uh, I expect the bond yields to start rising again. In particular, I'm paying very close attention to the two year and the ten year to look for that uh, that yield curve to uninvert. See, it's the T T ten year. Two year. This right here. The 10 year bond yields have been catching up pretty quickly to the two year. And once we cross the inversion line and get above the zero, that's when the real party starts when it comes to market sell offs. So that's one of the things that I'm, I'm watching and waiting for. I have all kinds of alerts set for when this eventually does happen. So, you guys have any, uh, any requests for anything? Let's see. What are CVRs? I'm sorry, Stuart. I actually don't know what CVRs are. If I can look up what CVR is and maybe get a definition, maybe I can explain the concept. Contingent value, right? That's the only that's the only thing that I'm pulling up when I search for it. You let me know if that's uh if that's what you're looking for. Contingent value right or CVR. <laughs> General Disarray says he I hope that he's uh he sends Apple and Spy straight into the crapper. I assume you're talking about um, Fed Chair Powell. Let's see. Well, I've been uh, I've been watching Apple pretty closely. Um, the tech market overall is still getting hurt pretty badly. We've had some uh, we've had a bit of bounce in Apple. So we might we might see a little bit of bullishness in the short term. But so far, it just looks like chop. And that's kind of what I expected. Apple is, it's sold off pretty hard this week. So we could see some more selling right now. It's still trading below a, um, it's still trading below the 50 on the one hour chart, which is something that I watch very closely. When I'm looking at short term uh, stock moves, I'm mainly paying attention to where the trend is relative to the 50 and the 200. And when I see it trading, when I see the 200, the 50, and the 20 all moving down in the same direction, and I see the price trading below the 50, I'm pretty bearish. And you can see that the 50 is pretty far below the 200 period moving average on the one hour chart. On the daily, um, Apple is well below both on the, um, on the daily candle chart. That doesn't mean that Apple can't see some upside. Like this is right about the time when you start to see some serious chop, but long term on Apple, I'm pretty bearish. And as you can see on the daily chart, we still have this uh, bearish cipher pattern. 
that showing a target going down to uh, $132.61, which is pretty reasonable considering that that's where we sold off to in the uh, early stages of our market, uh, early stages of our bear market. And as well on the daily, you have the MACD indicator showing downward momentum is still very strong right now. It's just in the short term, the RSI has hit the uh, 35, so we might get like a day or two of just bounce, maybe a little bit of chop. But we've still got a ways to go down yet. That's just my opinion. But right now, the whole market is surging. Like if you look at the stock heat map right now, like the whole market is green. What I paid the closest attention to is that the greenest areas of the market that are performing really well, and I mean like 3%, 4%, 5% gains, are consistently in the defensive sectors. So like retail, uh, consumer defensives, and consumer cyclicals are doing very well. You have Lowe's, Target, TJ Maxx, Dollar General, Dollar Tree. They're all doing really, really well today. Um, and the healthcare sector is also doing very, very well today. Just consistently, the defensive sector is what's performing right now. The tech sector is pretty green, but compared to the the uh, consumer defensive sectors, it's just all going crazy. The consumer durables is kind of an exception here because it's it's a mix of uh, it's a mix of car companies and uh, home builders, which I I find kind of surprising. But at the same time, the uh, the housing market and the uh, the real estate REIT market has been pretty badly beaten down. So this may just be a natural bounce in that cycle. Good example is if you take a look at um, let's take a look at uh, Dr. Horton. It's ticker symbol DHI. It's only <laughs> it's only been green. Two days in the past, uh, well, three days in the past two trading weeks. So is it oversold? Eh, maybe, but in my opinion, like I think that uh, I think the housing sector and home builders have a lot of pain yet to come. MACD is pulling them down pretty hard. Uh, STC indicator is red with more room to grow, and. Uh, the RSI is showing bearishness, like it's a clear slope down, and it has a little bit of room to bun, uh, bump up in the short term, but usually what we see is once the RSI cuts through its moving average, and then it bumps up to challenge or retest its moving average, it gets rejected, and then we see another leg of selling off. Hey, General Disarray, thanks for the five bucks. Here's a couple bucks for your Bones Coffee addiction. Thanks, dude. I love Bones Coffee. I'm sad that they won't. They won't affiliate with me. I guess something about um, something about a dude who rants about, you know, obscene things about cactuses and you know stock market manipulation just doesn't jive with their business model. But thank you so much, dude. I really appreciate that. You don't have to do that. I see APRN. I know that's Blue Apron. Um, people keep talking about. I I've been kind of like. Um, I've been kind of like standing to the side when it comes to the squeeze plays. There's a there's a small handful of them that I've been paying close attention to, like SST looks pretty good. Um, Blue Apron I know is really really excessive short interest. Um, I'm just I just hesitate because their business model is very similar to uh, you know Uber and DoorDash and Instacart and things like that, and I feel like they don't have a very good working business model. Um, the one thing that they have going for them is that they have cheap sources of labor because they dictate the terms of whatever they pay people. And I feel like the um, the employees that they, they get working for them, they are in a situation where they have to, uh, where they have to take what they can get. Cause you know, it's, it's the, <sighs> I don't want to say it like it's a bad thing, but I feel like these companies are deliberately taking advantage of their employees, and I just fundamentally disagree with that business model. I think it's a very short-sighted business model. But I see Blue Apron. 
Yeah, failure to deliver prints were pretty ridiculous. Almost 60% of the free float is sold short. And the free float, uh, or I'm sorry, 60% is borrowed. And you got 46% sold short with it still growing. It is interesting. I feel like I should get uh, take a look at Scourgebot and see what it says about Blue Apron. Curve turning green on the day. That's good to know. I haven't revisited uh, Torrid Holdings for a little while. Still bullish on them. But I know that the uh, the sell-off in their stock was... Uh, it it kind of came slow. Like, frustratingly slow. See, this is where I was hoping that it would hold up support. Was right here. Because we had had a wick down at uh, 545, and it had bounced and then kept going. So I was hoping that Torrid would hold up that position and find some strength here. Right now we're forming a spinning top candle, which is it's a nice reversal candle. I would like to see more. We got earnings tonight, so I'm I'm pretty I've got some pretty strong expectations for earnings. We'll see how Torrid performs going uh, going out of earnings and the week to follow. With these kind of plays, I feel like you can't play you can't play the earnings themselves because there's just so much volatility and chop, and the market is very easily manipulated on these low uh, low float stocks. Like, what's their float? Five point seven million. So it's very easy for them to get pushed around by big institutions. And what they could be doing is working it down in a um, what they could be doing is working down the price so that they can get more shares on the long side in order to like take advantage of the price being sent long uh, back towards its previous high at like eight dollars or eight fifty. Or they could just be beating the price down ahead of earnings, knowing there's gonna be a major sell off and they're just negotiating their way into their short position. Um, and trying to dogpile the stock ahead of earnings because they know that they'll be able to beat it down as fear takes hold. It's hard to say. Currently, what I see on Torrid is that on the daily chart, it's got a uh, it's got a little bit of support here at the 50 period moving average. So if we print a green doji candle or a spinning top like we've got currently, if we close like this, then that, in my opinion, would be bullish. Because right now the stock is, it's only barely been able to break out above its uh, 50 period moving average. It went on a nice run, which was awesome, but it needed to hold up support here. And it seems like it's doing that. It's right between its 50 and 100 daily moving average. So it's really, it's a really nice setup. I do like curve to $10 um, over the long term, um, longer than six months out is my opinion. I think that they'll do well coming out of, um, coming out of this earnings compression phase that we're going through right now, but will their earnings be good or not? I don't know. Okay. I see a few requests for GSAT, BBIG, and Fuse. I keep hearing about Fuse. What is that ticker? I can't seem to find it. That one's not turning up. Fuse Tech Technology. It's not on the U.S. exchange, so I'm not sure what that is. If you have the ticker symbol, I can take a look at that. 
BBIG, I think that we may be establishing a bottom support here. We have a double bottom on uh, August 23rd and again on 1st of September. And we've been printing some very wicky bullish doji candles. We have, a, uh, we have an inverted hammer candle and we have two doji candles back to back. I would I, I would say these are both spinning top candles. Now this could be part of a bear flag. If we look at this on a one hour chart, uh, one hour chart, this may just be a very simple bear flag. Got a wick down here. So if uh, if BBIG breaks to the downside, then we're probably going to see it back at 80 cents or so. But it looks pretty strong here. It, it's consistent with a double bottom pattern. So at least on the technical side, BBIG looks like it could break to the upside on this one. Let me take away that right extension because I'm just drawing, I'm just drawing a bear flag right here. So the two possibilities that I see here is it could break to the downside. That's the bearish outcome where it would bounce down to the bottom of this uh, supply or demand zone right around 81, 82 cents or so. That's where this chop occurred. And I'm calling that out specifically because that's where uh, consolidation will happen. Um, but the more likely scenario, in my opinion, is because we have the one hour chart showing that all of the uh, all of the moving averages are converging on this price level at around 90 cents. We're just working our way through some chop. And after we finish this consolidation phase, especially if we keep working our way to the upside, that eventually we'll break back out and get above the $1 level of resistance. That would be significant for BBIG because if we can break the $1 and hold it, then we can see some serious upside. Long-term, I'm definitely bullish on BBIG. Like if you go out two years from now, I think that we'll see BBIG make a full recovery back to where it was trading uh, last year in the um, in the high single digits. And my reasons for thinking that is just because of the uh, confidence that I have in the uh, Zash team that's working their way through the current court case. Um, I think that it's it, it's it's far from over, but I do think that the inevitable conclusion is that. BBIG, Vinco Ventures, is going to boot out John Colucci and the other bad actors that are currently in control of the stock. But um, yeah, I'll cover a couple more of the technicals because I see some nice stuff on the daily chart. We've been trading in a descending wedge, which is very, very nice. I like descending wedges. It's one of my favorite patterns. Uh, once we break out to the upside above $1.40, $1.50, then we'll be exiting this regression channel that we've been in for so long since late October. And we see some breakout to the upside, and we can see the chart return to prices like $3, $4, and so on. Now, that'll probably be a long wait, at least for a couple of months. But um, I, I'm, I'm confident going into next year that BBIG will make a very nice recovery. The other, uh, the other bullish indicators that I see is we did get this cross down on the MACD, but it seems to be consolidating on sideways price action. So this cross down, we might see the MACD cross back up very quickly, and that would be a huge sign of strength. We're very, very close to crossing zero on the histogram. And the STC indicator has been green for a little while. So if we keep up this sideways price action and work our way through this consolidation, I, I think that by the time we come out of it, it'll look very bullish. Hey, Hubba Taylor. Yes, we did talk about the SPY like right in the beginning. Um, if you go back to the first 10, 15 minutes of the video. Oh, hey, Clint. Thank you for... for letting me know that ticker. So phase is the ticker, phase holdings. Oh, wow. This thing got rugged hard. Um, yeah, this got pulled down really hard. I would stay out of this one and wait for, uh, and wait for this downward price action to complete. 
because this is this this one I would say stay out of its way and let it let it finish doing what it's doing. You're probably going to see it come all the way back down to its 200 moving average on the daily chart. If I go look at my Ortex data, let me go check out what that looks like. Okay. Estimated short interest of the free float is 99.6%. Wow. That's impressive. That's shocking, actually. That's truly shocking. The failures to deliver, man. What's the float in this stock? This stock has only like a million shares in it. it says that the free float, according to uh, TradingView, is 6.3 million. I wonder, did they announce dilution or something? I don't see anything being printed. Because this is, this is a powerful sell-off. Like shorts were getting creamed here. And then all of a sudden they weren't, and they were in full control. And I don't know why. I'll have to do a little bit deeper dive into this one. Let me go back to those ap uh, blue apron holdings. I was looking at the short exempts. I see some volatility coming into it. Short exempt ratio has been above three for the last four days, and it got up as high as 9%. Um, what was that, Friday? Yeah, it looks like Friday. It's interesting. There, there's a lot of shorting, uh, short exempts going into it, especially relative to its float. I know that Apron, Blue Apron, has a very small float. Oh yeah, yes, only seven point three million shares, and we see that. <laughs> wow, more than five times the float was traded on. August 30th. So that's that's quite a bit. Um yeah, I'd say this one could could get some legs beneath it. It's certainly acting that way. The MACD is very bullish right here. MACD crossed down, but it's curling back up to cross again. And this is this is one great big bull pennant right here on the daily chart. And it looks like it broke out. So next um Next step for Blue Apron would probably be to come back to retest $6 and for it to decide on its direction. So if Blue Apron holds $6, then I could I could see this one continuing. Absolutely. It's a very large pennant, but definitely a bullish pennant. Man, what was in those earnings that were so impressive? All right. Hey, Basil. So, uh, I see Basil asks, what's next after cleaning BBIG staff? Um, well, the very next thing is to finalize the merger between Zash and BBIG, at which point Zash will most likely have a final valuation that they will make a statement on between all of the uh, merging entities and platforms. They'll probably announce their roadmap and plan for uh, their road to profitability, which is an excellent... That's that's just going to be nothing but good news 
because once the uh, once the company is merged and that's finalized, then everybody can breathe a sigh of relief of okay. So now the companies are all together; they're all under one uh, set of leadership, and you have a confirmed partnership between. Um, what is the? I, I keep forgetting the company's name. Mind Think or something. <laughs> I, I, I always forget the name of this, but whatever that one is, uh, Ad Riser, um, Low Motive, and Cryptide, and those three platforms together, you'll have a uh, you'll have a massive you'll have a massive road a, a very clear route to profitability because one of them is monetizing NFTs and crypto. The other one is doing plain old good old fashioned ad revenue, which of course Wall Street loves to hear about. Um, we have the ban on TikTok coming, so Lomotif is the uh, natural competitor. It's the number two app in that category in the entire world. Mind Tank. Thank you, Stuart. I appreciate that. Um, and you have Mind Tank to help manage all of the AI related aspects between those platforms and a dedicated development team. Um, the Mind Tank team is focused on the ad riser uh, components, I do believe. So once you have all of those companies merged under one roof and under unified leadership, I think that it's kind of a no-brainer that uh, the company will suddenly be flush with cash from Zash, and you'll have all of the rights to those three main platforms between ad riser, Lomotif, and Cryptide that will help to monetize the platforms and maximize their outreach to new customers. Plus you have Facebook and Meta, which has been way underperforming. And with the TikTok ban, like where do people have to go really other than YouTube? Um, and YouTube doesn't do short form content very well. I'm not a big fan of short form content personally, but I know that that's kind of the direction that social media is going. Like even Instagram is giving up ground to TikTok and similar types of platforms right now. So I see that being the future for BBIG that once they actually come up with the numbers for their valuation, the stock's value will skyrocket. Because the market is pricing in BBIG like it's worth only a couple million dollars and we know for a fact that Zash has literally hundreds of millions standing behind it waiting to monetize the platform and maximize its profitability. Let's go take a look at AMC. AMC pulled uh, a, a nice turnaround today. It gapped down this morning, but it's closing green um, at around 157, 1.57%, which is a nice, yeah, it's a modest gain. It's not bad. AMC and Ape together, which I, I love this, by the way. Um, I, I see a clear double bottom printing on these two candles. So AMC and Ape together. We have a pretty deep wick on this red candle uh, from 1st of September. And since we have a nice close on this candle, we have a wick going below. But since we are closing up, I'm thinking that if our next day's candle is green and we move to the upside, ideally engulf the uh, the previous day's candle of September the 6th, we close up somewhere around $14 on the AMC Ape combined ticker. That will mean good things for both of the stocks. I consider them one and the same, which is my reason for putting them together like that. Ape right now seems to be forming a, well, honestly, it's a bear flag. So we need to see how it does. But I like where it's going. I like how it's got this consistent, solid base of support at $5. It doesn't seem to want to go there. It doesn't really like to break below it any further than where it is. No, I cannot hear Chef Pew Pew. I'm sorry. Chef, you're not coming through for me. Maybe it's my sound settings. 
Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the problem. I am the problem. You still can't hear me. <laughs> now I can hear you. It was me. It was my fault. Ta-da! Ta-da! You can hear us now. Oh man, it was so quiet. I thought that I was alone here for a minute. What's, no, what's you up, were guys? asking us how we were doing when you started the stream off, and we answered you. <laughs> you and just I just blew right off. past you yeah, like you, you didn't exist. Blew. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, my it's my okay. sound. I had unplugged my headset and plugged it back in to like take care of a little feedback problem. And apparently, Discord decided that my speakers and my headset stopped existing. So um, <laughs> that's fixed now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, Discord Discord does that to me all the time. My um I have a wireless headset and my batteries will go dead. And then when my batteries go dead, it loses the signal and so it just drops my headphones completely and it's like Discord's like, no, we don't want to use those anymore. <laughs> we were calling out spy passing three ninety eight earlier. Oh yes, man, sir. I missed it. Oh look at that. Now, I'm 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 thinking spy stops at uh 401 would be good, but I think that four 400 is the that's that's a nice take profit level. I wouldn't play it past the daily 50 moving average just because it, it what tends to happen that I've noticed is that every single time that the uh, that the candle touches those daily moving averages, then the algos flip on it and take it in the other direction. Like they watch those two moving averages of 50 and 200 on the daily candles so closely. As soon as they touch, it just goes the other way. 400 to 401 is definitely the target that I'm looking at after mm-hmm. it broke 306, after it broke 396 and then used it as support for a bounce. 400 here, to 401 a, is the target. Here, here's a magic YOLO play if you want one. Um, I, I need to give uh, I, I need to give this one up to uh, Tempestuous Persephone. Um, Dollar Tree is up. I think she called it out yesterday, like right there at the end of the day, and now it's up. <laughs> it's up. What is this? Dollar Tree is up three and a half percent today, <laughs> which I thought that was pretty impressive. Like that was an excellent call. It does this fish hook pattern, and then it gaps up. Like it creates a gap down and it uh, prints a death spike candle, consolidates into a fish hook pattern. And it did this right before earnings. And then it gapped up on earnings. And now we've had the earnings call, which was better than expected with a little bit of uh, a little bit of surprise to the downside on revenue. And the stock gapped down and now it's doing the fish hook pattern again. And I went and looked back at the chart and it did, it did something very similar. Where it had uh, it had gapped down on earnings, it consolidated to the side, and started running a couple weeks after that. So Dollar Tree is definitely in the defensive sector. So and I'm I'm liking the defensive side right now. So Dollar Tree, Dollar General, Ali Discount Stores, Walmart. Um, what else we got? Uh, healthcare stocks like Pfizer and AbbVie, um, Johnson and Johnson, all look good to me right now. But anything that's doing like cheap consumables, um, I I like the look of for the near term, going out till the end of September. Because what I've noticed going back in previous crashes, similar to what we're going through right now, is that all of these like super super cheap plays are huge performers during some of the worst earnings weeks for the big companies. Uh, Big Lots is another one, uh, ticker symbol big. This one is actually green today after posting um, a a rather bullish earnings a couple weeks ago. They still printed a loss on uh, on their earnings per share. But they've been uh, they've been doing very well and they're going into their ex dividend date. it looks like the X date is tomorrow. So today is the last day to buy uh, BIG stock in order to get a dividend. So we might get a little bit of a push going into close today on BIG now that I look at this. And who knows what will happen after the, uh, after the record date, but um, dividend hunters might be piling into this right now looking to get a, a quick dividend. 
what is their dividend for? Like, what's the payment? The gross is 30 cents per share. So that's, mm, it's a little bit expensive for a dividend hunt, but it's still in the realm of reason. BIG sold off pretty badly. And right now, price to earnings ratio has been totally out of whack on most of the stock market right now. What else do we got? T-Belt is doing surprisingly well today. It's suddenly feeling like turning around, it looks like. It's up 10.5% today. Up on up from an open of $2.44, so it's up to two sixty five right now. It's not like a super bullish print, but uh, there's a little bit more volume, and it's a little bit greener than it's been for the last several weeks. And it does look like it is finding some support. Might still have some downside for at least down till uh, $1.75. But, you know. Hey, Stuart. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take a look at CVRs. All right, so according to Investopedia, and I'll post this to the chat, and I know I basically just did a let me Google that for you, but... I'm just reading this off, and I'll try to understand it from Investopedia's reference. A contingent value right, or a CVR, refers to a right often granted to shareholders of a company facing restructuring or buyout. These rights ensure that the shareholders get certain benefits if a specific event occurs, usually within a specified time frame. The rights are similar to options because they frequently have an expiration date, beyond which the rights to the additional benefits will not apply. CVRs are usually related to the performance of a company's stock. They are granted to shareholders of a company by the acquirer. These rights stipulate that a shareholder will receive certain benefits if a specific performance event is met in a specific time frame. So this reads to me similar to a warrant. Um, I could see this being easily applied to bankruptcy situations. So any stock that is being restructured after bankruptcy, or if they are being restructured as a part of a buyout, then the buyer of the company, the acquirer, um, in either case, because both situations, there's an acquisition happening, um, the purchaser of the company dictates the terms, basically, especially in bankruptcy situations. Um, in the case of a general acquisition, and a merger, then the CVRs will decide what the current equity holders get out of the deal. So it's important to pay attention to. And if you can give me a ticker where this is happening, because I assume that you're, I, I assume that you're receiving a CVR. If uh, if you're asking, but if uh, if you have a ticker where this is going on, and you have a specific filing that you can refer to then that would help me out and I can try to take a look at it or maybe one of the analysts can help out. But this is my first time actually reading about a CVR. I'm not unfamiliar with the concept, but um, I, have not, I have not ever received a CVR. Let's go see what else is going on. Man, the meme market is just long and strong today. Even my energy plays are doing really well. Except Archon, for some reason. Archon is like a duck shot out of the sky. What else do we have? I saw Weber come across the feed. Yep, Weber looks like it's printing a double bottom. Definitely. Definitely a double bottom. Hate your demon. Hey, Scrap Clean, what can I do for you? Is that CVR sort of like a bargaining tool? Is that why it's used instead of whatever the traditional method is when these people negotiate in these kinds of transactions? I... I'm inclined to believe that this is, yeah, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a bargaining thing where they're trying to incentivize stockholders to hold on to their equity as opposed to selling. Because with a, uh, with a bankruptcy, 
the bankruptcy courts and the uh, and the creditors basically get to dictate all the terms. But a CBR sounds like it's more incentive. Uh, it, it's more incentive based. It would appear to me that uh, the actual value, and this is reading off of Investopedia again, since the real value of a CBR isn't discernible when they're issued, it's considered a risky asset. So shareholders, this is kind of a situation where I think that the acquirer is trying to convince shareholders to hold on to their stock and accept that risk in anticipation of a big payoff. Um, so I would consider this to be a more optimistic asset, uh, very speculative in its nature, as opposed to with bankruptcy, which is like, we're just taking everything and you just get the scraps sort of situation, you know? Yeah, and like they're trying to appeal directly to the shareholders and go around the management, sort of? Yeah, that's that's kind of how I'm interpreting this. It seems like it's a... Uh, yeah, it seems like it's an appeal directly to current stockholders of a company that's being acquired by a larger entity. That makes the most sense to me based on what I'm reading. Okay, there, here's, a, uh, here's a real world example from Investopedia. Um, oh, let me put this on my, uh, on my chart so that we can, we can read along together. So a real world example. Shareholders of Safeway received CVRs in May 2015 as a result of the merger of Safeway into Albertson's companies. That's the Kroger stores chain. And they were issued in connection to the sale of property development centers, which was Safeway's real estate subsidiary back in 2014. Shareholders were promised CVRs on the deal at the time. The first distribution was $0.17 cents per CVR uh, as of May 2017 and nearly a year later. In April 2018, Albertsons made its final distribution of 0. 0.00268 cents cash per CVR related to the sale of property. The former shareholders of Safeway Stop reaped another payout from additional CVRs based on the sale of Safeway's stake in a Mexican retailer, Casale, and they did better on this deal, receiving 93 cents per CVR in February 2018. This allowed Safeway's stockholders to share in the proceeds from the sell-off of assets of their old company. So that one sounds like a very beneficial outcome. And that kind of makes sense because Safeway before, it sounds like they were getting pretty badly beaten down, uh, not performing well as a retail store. I think they were mostly, I, I think they're mainly a grocery yeah, they're mainly grocery, and they have on um, the West Coast a lot of heavy competition from the Kroger-owned stores and Fred Meyer and things like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh wait, let's see. Kroger and oh, Kroger and Albertsons are competing with each other. Yeah. Uh, okay, that that makes sense. For I for some reason I thought that they were the same company. Got myself all confused. So Kroger is, yeah, Kroger is separate from Albertsons. So what I said before was incorrect. No, that's my bad. Let's see what else we got here. If you guys have any other requests, uh, feel free to call them out. I saw Weber. We'll look at Weber. Oh, I was just looking at Weber. I think I was about to call out this double bottom, and then I got distracted with talk of grocery stores. But this looks like a double bottom to me. Actually, a triple bottom if you count this big candle here. But this is a really weird gap down candle. Uh, Yeah, Weber actually looks kind of nice. It's sold off so much from its earnings. Worth keeping an eye on, I think. I wonder if I put a regression channel on this, if it would, uh, if it would look any different. Let's 
Well, a run to $7.50, according to the regression channel, seems like it's in its future. This was a pretty serious sell-off. I'm not sure what the hell this was all about. It just got smashed after it broke through its 200 period moving average. Never looked back. I want to take a look at Revlon again. It's printing a bear flag, unfortunately, but it's holding up this support on the 50 period moving average very nicely. It's very important for Revlon that it keeps holding up this support. If it can get some strength and break back above $8, then it can break above its 200 period daily moving average. That's that's what Revlon needs to do is get back above its 200 moving average cuz once it has just that random just that random surge of interest that seems to come out of nowhere, that's what causes its price to run. This was a bit extraordinary cuz this was when the uh announcement for that that bailout from the bankruptcy courts came. Oddly enough, I've been seeing a lot of Revlon commercials on TV and uh and a couple of like um YouTube ads and stuff. Fuse Ortex. Um, I was just looking at that a little while ago. Fuse Ortex was looking pretty ridiculous. The FTDs are definitely extraordinary. The short interest of free float, I think, is wrong. Um, it's probably more like 20% just because the uh, float seems to be misprinted by, uh, by Ortex. I could be wrong. I don't know the, um, it, it's, it's, um, it's phase holdings. I, there is no fuse, my dude. But this thing got absolutely smashed right now. So I'm, I'm not suggesting anybody just goes and buys this thing. It, it got absolutely pummeled, and it's probably got some downside to go just yet. So I would not be jumping into this right now. It, it looks really bad. The uh, The situation for this stock is not, not looking good. I would at least wait to see if it touches its 200 moving average and get a little bit of strength before looking back at it. Hey, Carl. Um, I did go over AMC and Ape. Um, I don't want to repeat myself too much. Um, I keep going back to uh, stocks that I've already revisited. So if you want to go back like about, I'd, I'd say I covered it, yeah, like 30 minutes ago, right around noon. If you want to go back there, I covered my thoughts on Ape and AMC. Still bullish on the VIX. Um, well, yeah, long term, I am. Um Right now, the VIX I think is getting a little bit of uh, a little bit of sideways chop right now, which is just honestly like I think that people are unsure of what the print is going to be for the rate hike. When Jerome speaks, then we're going to get the final word. But um, yeah, uh, once once the Fed decision on the print is in, I think we'll probably continue with selling. Because honestly, what I think is going to happen, Jerome has been so hawkish and the market hasn't responded very well to his uh, to his comments until Jackson Hole. And keep in mind that he wants the market to go down. The entire the entire premise of the Fed's strategy is to get the market to calm the hell down and start to retrace and go back in line with fundamentals. Right now, the price to earnings ratio is way out of whack on so many stocks. Like the breadth of stocks in uh, on SPY, for example, shows that like most stocks are trading at PE ratios greater than forty, which is nuts. And some some of them are trading at like crazy levels, like above eighty. And that what that translates to is that in order to earn a dollar. If you had a PE ratio of 80, then you would have to buy 80 shares to get one share's worth of payout in earnings. And that that's the ratio. That's an extremely expensive PE ratio. 
So stocks being that expensive is part of what's driving inflation and part of what's causing, uh, it, it's part of what's making the Fed's job so difficult. So the more the stock market rips, the more that Jerome Powell is going to want to tear it down and get the market to relax and contract back to the downside. Because despite where we currently are with the market uh, selling off this much, we are still seeing a massive break from fundamentals in the current market right now. Like this is still expensive when you look at the overall stock market. Just take a look at the weekly and consider how fast our market grew and how much uh, equity expanded in just the last two years. It's kind of crazy. Even if we go from the top of the COVID pandemic, not accounting for the crash, we're still up. We were still up 40% over the last two years. That's greater than the SPY's performance of four years in a row. So let's see, where are we at? 20... So if we go from January 2016 to January 2019, so three years, that's about the same. That's about the same growth. Three years worth of uh, of stock market performance, and this market surge came at a time when we should have been going into a contraction phase. So our stock market right now is like really, really overbought. And things are still this expensive in the midst of one of the worst energy crises <laughs> that the world's ever seen. We've got uh, Europe that's getting ready to freeze its ass off because of uh, lack of access to natural gas. Um, oil is still really expensive. It's calmed down in the last couple of weeks, but you know, since the Ukraine crisis, oil got supremely expensive, and that caused big supply chain issues. And this is kind of like this is kind of an aside, but still related. There's a big collateral crisis going on with uh, things like T bills in the bond market. So all of that translates to big turmoil and problems at the upper echelons of the economy. And meanwhile, the stock market is just still performing way better than it should, historically speaking. Logical chaos says VIX to 50 before November. Um, <laughs> honestly, I I kind of hope you're wrong just because I know what that would mean for the entire world if volatility yeah. and fear took that much control of the market. The last time that we saw the VIX at 50 was COVID. <laughs> so if we saw that kind of a move, Look, third leg of this downtrend in SPY. Jesus. I mean, if it's going to happen, it's going to be the third leg on the way down. That would be truly terrifying, though. 100% yeah. move in the VIX before November. Really profitable. It would be very would profitable if you were positioned correctly. But, like, think about how many people... Now, how much loss that'll translate to? I think that you could be right. Eh, for it'll the, come back for the sake of for the sake of the world. I guess what I'm saying is that for the sake of the world economy, I kind of hope that we're all wrong about it'll the crash come because back. it's easier it's easier to be financially stable in a time when the economy is stable and everything's fine, and you know we're all we're all making money, going you know in the in the upward trajectory, you know. When things get scary like this, it's hard to make money. It's hard enough to make money in the stock market, but it's also hard enough to hold your value just because you got inflation going crazy and everything's getting super expensive. Costs go up for all the manufacturers and businesses start to lose the ability to get credit.
Hey, Clint. Uh, so the appointment of a chair on the clinical advisory board for Biora, do I think that means anything? Um, honestly, I actually didn't look at that uh, particular piece of news, so I don't know. I don't know who that is that received that board seat, but I'll take a look. Let's see if that actually printed in the news. Biora is beaten back down below 70 cents, which I find supremely frustrating. No news. If you wouldn't mind sharing an article in the Discord, that would that would help me out. I'll be happy to go over it. Let's go check on everything else. Bed Bath & Beyond had quite a crazy day today. Back above its 200 average on the five-minute time frame. Let's look at it on the one hour. Yeah, this is a nice bull flag on Bed Bath. This is this is very nice, actually. The one hour on Bed Bath & Beyond looks super strong. This is a bull pennant, actually. I would love to see this thing go nuts. That would be cool. See Bed Bath & Beyond go on a tear again. I, I also saw I saw the news about um, the CFO um, threw himself from his apartment balcony. It was, it was really terrible to read about. I saw the, uh, the conspiracy theories and the, the waves of conspiracy going out there um, <laughs> about like secret connections between Bed Bath beyond and uh and russian oil because a similar thing happened to a, a russian oil oligarch that um quote fell from a window uh of a hospital which i <laughs> i'm like okay that that totally sounds natural there's just a lot of a lot of bad news going on everywhere Oh boy. Uh Steve Gentil asks if I'm bullish on SST. I am. I am bullish on SST. Whoops. Not what I meant to click on. SST is getting some pullback today. Um, but that's okay. The positions that I was uh oh wait, wait a second, it retraced. It bounced back. Nice. Nice. Awesome. All right. So the pullback that I saw today. On SST was actually that's totally fine. Um, I know that it was uh, it was challenging twelve dollars uh, just yesterday, and then it's gotten its pullback and now it's bounced again. Nice V shape recovery on the five minute chart, very nice. A good little bullish engulfing candle took it right back in the uh, opposite direction. Now it's trading back above its two hundred on the five minute. On the hourly chart, SST is setting up some very nice higher lows, bouncing off of its 50 smooth moving average. That's a good trend. I like that a lot. And the RSI is smack down in the middle, uh, just below its moving average, which is, this is very nice. It's consolidating to the upside. I like that a lot. I do like that very much. So yes. Short version answer to your question, I am bullish on SST. I really do like the gamma ramp setup for that one. Let me go ahead and uh, catch up with, or, uh, with the uh, Discord chat. Thanks, Clint, for the, uh, for the article. Appreciate that. Let's go DD, see this, this, is, this is a little weird, but I'm going to post this in the... Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna post this in what do, what do you want it? Live stream chat or question? I'll put it in questions for you um, to take a look at. Questions is best. All right. This is kind of awkward. I just threw a fib extension on VIX. It's close. All right. Let's let's all share this together. 
not seem at least like relatively close to the time zones? Oh, I see. You're doing a fib time zone. Yeah, that that is pretty close. I mean, the spikes to 50, like you get one in 2008, uh, yeah, like late 2008, obviously, one in uh, early 2010, end of 2011, 2016, and then 2020. And there's that one in the middle in 2018 that doesn't technically hit anything. But I'm just, uh, this was just like first draw. Like I just threw it on there and kind of messed with it and was like, wow, these are actually kind of close to the time zones. Let's do something even more fun. Let's go and do the same thing, except let's include the dot com boom and do it on a monthly. But I do, I do see what you're, I do see what you're pointing out. Yeah, the fib time zones land on some pretty reliably volatile dates in history. <laughs> For those that don't know what we're looking at, those vertical lines that you're seeing are a FIB time zone. It's not a technical indicator that I see used very often, but what folks tend to do is they it's it's theorized that you might see big periods of volatility uh, on on a FIB timeline, uh, and you might see consistency between different uh, between different dates. Going back to like, you know, it, it may not necessarily be major crashes. It might it might be something else like um like just uh significant price action in a particular stock. But the purpose of the FIB timeline is to uh look for any consistencies between major price action in uh on chart history. So here's a FIB time time zone on um, this is a monthly chart going back to uh, 1993 on the SPY, and I see that the first one going from the base of 1994, which was just after a recession, uh, just coming out of a recession, and then we went into the dot com bubble, which popped in early 2000, and now I see another one. Uh, right here, the, this next line landed right at the beginning of the subprime crisis, which uh, really hit its peak in June, July of 2007, and then resulted in the crash in 2008, shortly thereafter. We have this one, which is uh, July of 2013, which is when we, it, it's a little bit after we broke the high from the 2008 chart. And now, we're coming up on a FIB timeline in 26, uh, 2026. <laughs> Let's see if I go, if I go to the bottom of the dot com crash, all the way to the top of two thousand and eight. What do we get then? Well, I can see this this time zone line landed on a on. April 2018, which is right about when we should have, according to cyclical theory, been going into a recession. <laughs> and we just didn't because the Fed kept printing money. And we've still been going up that whole time. If we go to 2008 till... We'll go to the peak of 2015. Interesting. It's kind of fun. It's mostly just speculative theory. It probably doesn't mean anything. <laughs> probably. Yeah, I mean, I probably. definitely wouldn't be basing trades off of it or anything, but it's kind of it's just kind of cool to see to see it actually play out. Yeah. Yeah, it is. All right, let's see. Spy is starting to get a little bit dicey here at the top of uh of its 30 minute chart
This candle might close green, though. It's the last candle on the day for the hourly. The SPY has just gone green. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven candles in a row. Uh, and theory goes that between 9 and 12 green candles is when you will see big pullback or correction. So morning might look nice for the SPY. But given that it is Thursday, tomorrow, I think we'll probably see some rough waters ahead. Let's go take a look at the calendar and see what else we got. So we got uh, the jobless claims coming out in the morning, and Fed Chair Powell is going to be talking at, let's see, that is 20 minutes before the market opens. The EIA crude oil and gas stocks are going to be announcing their uh, change of supply situation. And that is going to dictate some serious volatility in the market. That'll be happening at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So, hmm, interesting. I'm betting what we are going to hear is that job numbers are better than expected and Powell is going to get the unemployment numbers or the initial jobless claims that he is looking for. He's still going to come out hawkish on the market. The market is going to stupidly not believe him because they've done this. The market has done this pretty consistently. He'll come out during his uh, his speech hawkish, but maybe we'll get that 100 basis point hike. I don't know. That would be pretty crazy if we did. But either way, this is this is an excellent time to, if you are bearish on the market and betting on major, major, major downturn going out till the end of September, this is probably a good time to consider an entry. Because if that, if we end up getting a pretty stiff print on the, uh, on the uh, federal funds rate hike. I think that 75 is probably going to happen, but the market seems to be pricing that in. And if the Fed comes out with a surprise 100 basis point, which according to the polls, this was just a this is just a very very modest poll taken by yours truly on YouTube and Twitter, a lot of people most people thought that 75 basis points is what's coming, but some are expecting as bad as a 100 basis point hike. And so far, we still haven't done a 100 basis point hike. So I think it could happen. It would be really bad for the market. But that's kind of what I'm betting on, honestly. We'll see how it goes. Going into the last candle of the day on the one hour chart. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to count these candles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we're on the tenth candle. And if we print a red engulfing candle here at the close of the day, then I think we see some big pullback. Looking at this, uh, looking at this harmonic that uh, the harmonics indicator just put on our chart. This is a bearish butterfly or an anti-butterfly pattern, which is, is is a harmonic chart. And I do have mine set with a very tight margin of error. It's a 4% margin of error. So this is a true harmonic or very close to a true harmonic. I need to get better at making these manually because I don't like the idea of trusting a automated algorithm with uh, trading view to do this for me but I'm looking at all of the indicators and I see that the RSI is just red hot right now it's coming back down from 80 we have some very tall 
candles throughout the entire day. The spy is up. Jeez, like the spy g- gained back everything that it gave up for the last two days. It's closing back at almost two percent today, and we have ten green candles on the thirty-minute chart in a row. So if you were playing this uh, market for the rip to the upside and you were expecting a, a bounce, then boy, you got it. But now we've got some resistance ahead of us. It might We might see the market reach 401. I got some of the analysts calling 401. But for me, I think, I think Chair Powell might be done messing around. The market has not been taking him seriously, and overall the credibility of the uh, of the Fed is extremely low. So I I'm worried. I'm both worried and optimistic that they will finally announce a 100 basis point hike. And if they do that, there will be there will be a the market will throw an absolute temper tantrum. That's just my thoughts. I could. Totally be wrong. But it's just my opinion. Let me expand my regression channels a little bit. <laughs> Semper Fi says agreed we're dead. <laughs> I hope not. I hope that Hell's Trading Floor and the rest of uh, the retail community that has uh, pulled itself together over the last couple of years and trained themselves and each other about how to identify market trends are going to uh, do well. I'd like to be optimistic. I would like to be optimistic. Looking at the Nasdaq, I see that we're we're struggling right here at a area of resistance that was previously support here in late August. This is a pretty this is a pretty significant area of support here. We took some time breaking through this level where we had to uh, break up, retrace, and then break out, and now we're having the exact opposite move. We came down through that level. We're breaking up into it. And I think that NASDAQ gets rejected at 12,400 uh, 12, and pulls back down to the downside. The harmonic is its nice and all, but I don't really trust it on this. Because we're looking at this on a daily time frame. I would be more. I would more likely trade a harmonic on a daily time frame if it was with the trend of the market. Right now, this harmonic is saying it's calling against the trend of the market. So I think this harmonic will end up being wrong. That's that's my thinking. Short term, we might get some bullish upside, but I think for the rest of the month. At least by the uh, at least by the end of September, we're going to be trading back down at this previous support level. I, I think we see the market coming back here to the uh, to the middle of the regression channel by the end of September. I am I am very very bearish on the overall market. Small caps are in a similar situation right now. The IWM, the Russell, has been getting hurt pretty badly. It's got a nice pop today, but I don't think this lasts the rest of the month. IWM might be nice for the rest of the uh, for the rest of this week, but uh, I don't know. I'm I'm really hesitant just because I know Fed Chair Powell is coming out to speak tomorrow. What else do we got? Anybody else have any uh, any requests? Cheers to everybody who took the time to uh, to hang out in the live stream. Appreciate having everybody. Oh, 
<laughs> why why has Dwack not pooped the bed yet? That's a good question. For those that weren't uh, that that weren't aware of Dwack right now, um, there's some uh, there was some pretty bearish statements made about uh, the company is apparently uh, failing to uh, to receive shareholder approval for a um, for a merger extension, and it looks like the uh, merger of Digital World Holdings, that's Trump's social media company for Truth Social, might fail. So if that is the case, then the SPAC will be set to be liquidated on Thursday, and the money it raised in its September 2021 initial public offering will be returned if no further action is taken. So they might try to come up with something to uh, delay the inevitable, but... Um, this this might be a dead spack right here, like this this might be uh, this might be one of the ones that don't make it, and right now the uh, the puts that are printing on DWAC, uh, for let's see what was the price. If we look at the live flow, there's not enough time for me to analyze this before you can get your puts if you're interested. But if this back fails, it's going to zero, and it's due to make an announcement tomorrow, so it could go either way. But the puts are like trading at two bucks per sh contract right now, uh, for ten dollars. The ten dollar strike, like it's it's ridiculously cheap. Even for me, who's I've become a very risk averse trader, I'm I'm I would still be willing to throw a hundred dollars at that. currently trading at a dollar per contract according to general disarray so thanks for the heads up dude yeah yeah there's 71 percent puts on on this ticker right now so we'll we'll know what the word is tomorrow there may be time the market's closed now so ding 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 that's the closing bell um but if dwac uh if dwac announce uh, doesn't make an announcement first thing in the morning then there may be an opportunity to enter into like a super super cheap position. This is this is like a super risky play. Like I'm I'm not recommending anybody do this. This is the definition of a gamble. But it's a very cheap gamble, I guess is what I would say. Like the ten dollar puts are trading. Let me go look at my um, let me go look at my options trading platform. DWAC is trading at for the September sixteenth puts for a ten dollar strike are they're literally a dollar they're literally a dollar per option contract so like it's the definition of a gamble don't get me wrong like you'll probably lose that money just giving you strictly full disclosure like anything that you bet on something like that ninety nine thousand times out of a hundred thousand you're gonna lose but if for whatever reason dwac fails and the spac dies then those puts will be worth a thousand dollars per contract overnight general disarray asks if it's a dead spac explain what happens to the contracts so the puts give you the the right to uh to sell shares for 100 or let's say you do the $10 strikes, right? And they're currently trading for $1 each. So those puts give you the right to sell uh, to sell your shares to somebody else for $10 per share. And that translates to $10 times 100 shares, which is $1000. So if you buy one contract of DWAC for $10 strike price and you purchase that for $1 and suddenly tomorrow DWAC fails and goes to zero, then the value of those puts immediately goes to $10 per share or $1,000 per contract because nobody will be able to sell their shares anymore. Like this is 
this is very, very much not financial advice. It's the definition of a gamble. <laughs> but if DWAC fails, then everybody who's still holding on to shares that wants to sell them at all will have to buy puts in order to get rid of them. Or at least they'll have to do that ahead of time before the actual failure of the company is completed. So this this is one thing that you should be very careful of. Don't bet stupid amounts of money on it because it's super, super risky. But if you are right and you spend that $1 on that contract, then it might be $1,000 if, if that happens. If DWAC fails and goes to zero overnight, which is possible, not likely, but possible, then you turn $1 into $1,000. It's literally a, a, a 9,999% profit. So, yeah, you, you, it's, it's, it's up to everybody else. You do what you want. Like, it's not, so, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> y'all in the chat scare me. I know you're joking, but y'all still scare me. <laughs> and I don't want to get political about this stuff, but uh, Trump Trump has not uh, has not really managed this spec very well. From just on my opinion, um, the premise of how he uh, of how he created this company um, of of Truth Social and the Digital World Acquisition Company was just based on like. Well, Twitter and Facebook won't have me, so I'm going to make my own and I'm just I'm just going to do this because and that feels like very <laughs> it kind of feels like somebody just going, "Man, I want to do what I want." It's like it it's, it seems kind of childish, okay? So that 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 kind of like doesn't inspire much faith that he's fully committed to the success of this company actually becoming a thing i could be wrong but it's it, if, if he just decides like it's not worth it fuck it you know screw everybody else and just closes this back then it just dies and he seems like a very wishy-washy investor when it comes to this stuff and the whole thing seems like he just did it because he was mad that's just my opinion can I just add to that that it probably doesn't help matters that there was an SEC filing that basically referenced uh, he might run for president or go to prison as a material concern, which, you know, that's, that's is also a very valid concern. Like I said, I'm not trying to get political, but yeah, if somebody who's a former president talking about irony, <laughs> like we're talking about a former president who might be getting charged with some serious shit would probably not be good for the company or the SPACs that he owns. It would be a or very, very running, bad thing for them. Or running for president again. That's the other flip side of that same SEC filing. <laughs> Both yeah. of those things. <laughs> Let's go take a look hey, at uh, GameStock. I, I hear I, I hear that GameStonk is, is doing some hey. crazy shit right now. Look at that. Real, wow. quick, real quick before you move forward. Right. It, Robot uh, Captain Insano was telling me to make sure I brought up the 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 people in in the Discord that were flipping all the DWAC puts recently. Mm -hmm. Like they were buying them all up for a penny and then selling them for two cents, and just they just kept kept flipping them one after another. And he was also saying that uh, Savvy ended up grabbing a whole bunch for a penny and sold them all for ten cents. <laughs> oh, that's funny! Wow, y'all just became your own market maker. Oh, percent return on penny puts for DWAC. That's silly. Hey, well done. That's a good. That's a good thousand percent profit. <laughs> that's yeah. valid. Yeah. That's that's silly. That's, that's silly of, I mean, and also that's, incredibly that's, smart. Yeah, it's awesome returns, man. They were talking about it for like two or three days in a row. I think that they were doing them. Oh my goodness, GameStop! What is happening to you? It's like going bipolar. What is? What it's is uh, it doing? earnings. They're, they're, yeah, they're reporting earnings after uh, after close today. I know. I'm just like watching it move by. Like, what is this? It's like moving by like five percent at a time. Oh, it's, it's not quite happening. It's just like three percent. <laughs> it's oscillating between three percent.
gain loss in either direction. Wow. That market close candle and volume was actually really impressive. The candle didn't move, but it was uh, it was almost half a million shares traded in the last five minutes. That is a hilarious profit. Congratulations, Savvy. That was actually that's actually really cool. <laughs> Let's go see what else uh, everything else is doing. Let's see, we've got. You know what? We may as well watch a whole bunch of stuff. Let's see. BBBY is getting sold off. Uh, BBIG is not really doing anything. So let's look at AMC and GameStop. Uh, SST also not really doing anything in after hours. And Curve is announcing their earnings today. I'm not going to stream earnings. Um I'm not. I'm not going to be able to commit to hanging out for a full hour while they do their earnings call. Um, it looks like the market is thoroughly upset with whatever curve issued. So, but who knows? It's like not the first time that we've. It wouldn't be the first time that we see the earnings are absolutely fantastic, and then it sells off after hours, and they smash the price, and then. The very next day, it takes off in the other direction. And when it comes to earnings, I just give up. <laughs> buy buy a straddle or a strangle or something, and just call it a day. And wherever the chips fall, you know, take your profit wherever you can. That's how I see it these days. <laughs> earnings just make no damn sense. Let me let me see in the chat what what's the last ticker that you want to see in after hours. Oh, oh holy GameStop! What? <laughs> what? I just saw GameStop shoot to twenty seven dollars, twenty eight. What in the heck is going on? That's amazing. Look at it go. GameStop. <laughs> Wow. You know what? I was bullish on GameStop. I was looking at the I was looking at the chart today and I'm like, you know what? GameStop looks really good. I wonder what's happening. AMC is following it too now. That's funny. AMC is doing the same thing GameStop is doing just because of what GameStop is doing. Look at the RSI. It's so red hot right now. Dude, that's funny. Maybe I will stream earnings for GameStop. I can't really stay, though. Okay, so they beat their EPS and slight miss on revenue. Yeah, $130 million miss on revenue. So they must have cut their expenses pretty well. Nice. That's that's good. I was holding I was holding out hope that uh that GameStop would surprise us. I believed. I believed in the power of Game Stonk. What's everybody else in? How's everybody doing? Oh, we've already got AMC on. We've already got AMC on the chart. Let me let me do AMC plus ape. How does that sound? We'll do AMC plus ape on one chart, and we'll see the value of them moving together because they're they're pretty much tied together by the hip, you know. How about GSAT? I don't know if you have it up there. GSAT? I haven't even looked at that ticker today. Global Star. Oh, you know what? I looked at this for a short squeeze play a long time ago. I was looking at the. Um, that speculation about them and Apple finally came to fruition today. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. And some devices, I don't know which ones it was. It just came out a little while ago. Oh, wow. I remember that I was talking about this one a long time ago, like back in May or April, and it just kind of fell off of my radar. It was floating around its 200 daily moving average. 
and I saw that it was a huge heavyweight on the IWM. It has a huge weight on the IWM just because of how many shares it has and how much of it is uh, held by IWM. And if this thing, I think I estimated that if this thing went to like $8, that it would actually outweigh the market cap of AMC held on IWM. And it's an Internet of Things company. I do like Internet of Things companies. I like Internet of Things in general. Maybe because I have a soft spot for raspberry pies and such. I bought this way back on, I think when I bought first bought Prague, I want to say back around November um, of last year, because there was speculation about Apple um, deals way back then. That's an interesting candle right there. Curve is getting smacked. They had earnings. They have a conference call at 4.30. Which, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stay for. But I'm assuming something just terrible happened, or something amazing happened, and so they're selling off. One of the two. It's either incredible and it's going to change the uh, future of the company forever, <laughs> and so it's so selling off. <laughs> it's two percent, I think, um, of sales increase over thirty some percent either last quarter or last year. But you know how that goes: good news is bad news, or people take profits. I guess. If I look at where it is on its chart, <laughs> if it's good news, then whoever's taking profits is an idiot. <laughs> they would have had to buy it at the bottom. I'm just assuming that it's more shenanigans, like always. But oh well. I want to take a look at Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree was doing a monstrous move. I'm expecting it to gap up tomorrow just because it's done it before. The last time it did this exact same thing was right before its earnings, and then on earnings, it gapped back up to where it started. It would be amazing if it did it again. Man, look at GameStop. That is an absolutely hilarious candle. All right. Well, I've got 15 minutes left, and then I'm going to take off. Fubo is being requested. I'll take a look at Fubo really quickly on the big chart. On Bloomberg, it's showing GameStop forms a partnership with FTX. No terms announced. Oh, really? Do you have that article, Scrap Queen? Would you mind throwing that in live stream questions so I can take a look at that? I'll look for it, but it's on the news. Oh. See Fubo TV. I actually like this company as a streaming service. Yeah, it's looking actually like it's uh, found its bottom. That's encouraging. I like the MACD uh, as well. It's moving in the right direction. I would probably be a little bit more patient waiting for the consolidation to end before entering a position just because I do like... Uh, I do like to use uh, calls, and on the hourly chart, I can see it's probably going to get rejected by its 200 moving average, so I might look to pick it up at around like 350. But that's kind of like really skimming the bottom. 
I'm just gonna wait for some downside. But long term, looks looks good. I like it. I like this setup. It's a very nice setup. It looks like it could also be setting up a diamond bottom as well. Let me see if my if I can draw this. So with a diamond bottom, you get this kind of move. And then it goes back in the opposite direction. So you kind of look for symmetry in the chart where the highs and lows look very similar to a head and shoulder pattern. But it's at the bottom of the chart on a long-term time frame. So I kind of I kind of like how that's setting up. It's a really nice uh, it's a really nice chart pattern. I would like I would like to see if it can hold up support at three dollars, just because I see that's where it bounced here and here, and it consolidated below it there. So if it holds up three dollars, I'll wait to see if it ends up back there, and holds that level of support. Then I would be interested in taking a position. But for me, it's probably not one that I would rush into just because this one has a lot of competition. All right, let's go check out GameStop again. What are they doing? Who, buddy. Look at that. <laughs> oh, man. Who is, who is streaming the GameStop? Uh, who is streaming the GameStop earnings? Anybody doing that today? Any, anybody on YouTube that we know? We can we can send everybody to go and watch their earnings call and uh, Give me a second, I'll double check. emojis. <laughs> Give me a second, I'll double check. I'm looking for no no. Hey Bankster, uh, I see your question. What's my stream schedule? Saw you on Trey's stream and wanted to watch more. Appreciate that, dude. Um, yeah, I unfortunately because of how my work is, uh, I don't have a reliable stream schedule which is kind of frustrating for everybody, I understand. Um, but just because of the nature of my work, where I'm constantly taking client calls, some days I'll have like all day long to stream and I can hang out with everybody. And other sometimes I'll be like an entire week of just total, just totally booked out and can't do anything. So that is unfortunately like really uncertain for me right now. Um, if someday in the future, just my YouTube career takes off, then I promise you guys will be the first to know. <laughs> I posted a PDF file with the GameStop information on FTX partnership. Oh, that's excellent. All right. Thank you, Scrap Queen. Man, always, always look at the split with the, uh, with the news and articles. I appreciate that. Let's go see what GameStop's statement is all right this is this is from benzinga gamestop corp today announced that it's entered into a partnership with ftx us the partnership is intended to produce more gamestop or introduce more gamestop customers to ftx's community and its marketplaces for digital assets in addition to collaborating with ftx on new e-commerce and online marketing initiatives gamestop will begin carrying ftx gift cards in select stores during the term of the partnership, GameStop will be FTX's preferred retail partner in the U.S. Financial terms of the partnership are not being disclosed. That's awesome. So those of you that don't know, FTX deals in crypto and NFTs and other digital assets, which is absolutely fantastic. I, I love the sound of that. FTX is, uh, oddly enough, one of the, one of the um, big companies that... Um, that uh, Cryptide is looking to compete with. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, um, Bankster, to get back to your um, to your question. Yeah. If. Uh, even though I can't have a reliable streaming schedule yet, um, our Discord has people constantly sitting in voice chat all the time doing analysis for various stocks. Um, everybody is always chatting in voice chat constantly. 
And even if I'm not streaming, I'll usually hang out there and I'll be able to chime in in between client calls. So I, I, I'm I much more present in the Discord than I am on YouTube. I try to get the content out there and do my analysis so that everybody else can see it as often as I can. But uh, for the Discord, I'm I'm there... I'm there at least three, four days out of the week, just hanging around and uh, and throwing my analysis and two cents out there for everybody. Plus, we're feeding each other plays constantly and calling out alerts and stuff like that. So it's all one big happy family. If that's something that interests you, we now have a um, we actually now have a trial for our Discord. So if you want to check it out. You can do a trial basis for Denizen access. That's the first tier. You just go to hellstradingfloor.com and click tier one, and uh, you can sign up for a one-week trial period and just hang out with us. Um, I don't know if you recognize Chef QQ, but he's one of uh, Trey's mods as well. So we we talk back and forth all the time, um, and sometimes Trey will <laughs> pay us a visit occasionally if he's not doing a stream. We we all like to share our uh, we all like to share our our due diligence and research as often as we possibly can. Retail stronger together. Glad to see some new faces here in the stream. I'm, I'm seeing some names I haven't seen before, so it's really cool to see everybody jumping in. I know a lot of uh, folks came over from Trey's stream, so uh, thanks for thanks for coming by, listening in. I'll be doing a lot more analysis on uh, broader market, things like that. I'm mainly trying to uh, help everybody navigate this freaking crash that we're going through right now. It's it's been it's been rough sailing. <laughs> hence the the thumbnail and title of this stream but uh we've been doing pretty well all together i would say been managing to catch the big swings uh mostly intact man i i i I don't like this gravestone that I see on SQs. This is after hours, but that looks like a that looks like a that looks like a really bad gravestone candle. Someone's asking about the origin of your name, your screen name. Oh, sure. Um so um my screen name True Demon actually refers to Unix systems. There's there are programs called daemons spelled d-a-e-m-o-n and they're basically just background programs they just run in the background of the operating system and they do mundane tasks you know like tracking the clock or um you know they'll run a web server or something like that so a true daemon is a daemon program that is currently running hence true daemon so the uh that was where the name came from but I started getting accused by uh, just a bunch of, you know, keyboard warriors on Twitter that I was a devil worshiper. <laughs> so I kind of leaned into the joke and created Hell's Trading Floor. And now that's that's where all of that comes from. So I just kind of owned it. And honestly, it sounded pretty cool and fun. <laughs> so so that's that that's where my name comes from. There's actually a video on the channel about that called How I Became True Demon. So the price for the Discord, just to get in for uh, for like the basic tier where you can join the trading floor voice chat and stuff, that's three bucks a month. Or I'm sorry, we we bumped our prices. It's five dollars a month now. Um, we've been using Patreon, but that is going away. We uh, we we don't want to be uh, we don't want to be cost prohibitive, keeping people out. The uh, the idea is that we're just trying to we're trying to help educate people on how to play the market both ways, um, trying to look for good plays. We can sometimes catch some pretty nice squeezes, but with us being in a bear market, we've kind of been 
transitioning our entire strategy into trying to catch big swings in the bear market and focusing on the broader uh, broader stocks, paying real close attention to like the bonds and things like that, which are not as fun to play, but are immensely helpful in helping you figure out if the market is going to dump or rip the next day. Right now, the market's pricing in a little bit more upside tomorrow, but I'm kind of hoping that Fed Chair Powell is just going to stand up on that podium, take a nice deep breath, and rip the rug out from under everybody. Yeah, there's uh, there is no there is no experience restriction to join the Discord. We are absolutely not about gatekeeping or uh, any kind of any kind of restrictive behavior or anything like that. We we like to educate everybody. So if you're new to trading and you feel like uh, like you've never been able to find a safe community to hang out in that um, offered you. Uh, that offered you solid education, then Hell's Trading Floor is a great place to start. APRN is up 21%. And Curve is starting to get bit up again. That pummeling early on in after hours was pretty pretty severe. Oh yeah, APRN is starting to get bit up a little bit in after hours. It's not not much, but I like how it's bouncing off of its moving average on the RSI, and that uh, this this bullish pennant is uh, quite nice, also. Okay, I think that's going to have to be it today. Uh, good luck to everybody, um, and thank you so much for stopping by the stream to hang out. Currently, GameStop looks like it's having a really, really good after uh, a really good earnings report. The partnership with FTX is Excellent, wonderful news for the company and the outlook of the uh, of GameStop. I'm currently looking at AMC to start to rebound as well. Um, it's got a very nice double bottom on the AMC plus eight uh, combined chart, and right now Curve is getting hurt a little bit, so we'll have to wait and see on that play. For everything else, when it comes to the broader market. I do still expect quite a lot of significant downside for the rest of the month, so just be careful. Uh, I'm still bullish on oil and energy, but I'm waiting until the uh, I'm I'm waiting until we get some confirmation. We're gonna get some oil and gasoline supply news tomorrow in the uh, in the late morning, so there may be an opportunity yet to uh, see a bounce in the energy market. Keep an eye on tickers XOM for ExxonMobil, which is basically the Apple of oil stocks, as well as XLE, which is the energy sector ETF for S&P. And uh, also keep a close eye on defensive sectors. Think Walmart, discount stores like Dollar Tree, Dollar General, um, or Ollie discount stores, which is a personal favorite of mine. And if you guys... Uh, are looking to get into something that is hopefully going to perform well during the late stages of this uh, ongoing recession, that uh, those will treat you right. That's going to be it for me. Thank you guys so much for stopping by to the stream, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, have a hell of a time in the markets.